The Holy Family Catholic Church in Gaza City is currently under siege by Israeli forces. Hundreds have taken cover inside. 54 of them um, are disabled people who moved there after Israeli forces reportedly shelled the convent they live in. A mother and her daughter sheltering inside have been killed by sniper fire and others have been wounded while going to the bathroom. It's a completely disastrous, dreadful, horrific situation. Now, responding to this news on LBC was Jerusalem's Deputy Mayor, Fleur Hassan Naum. Why is it necessary, it would, is reported, to start shooting, having snipers outside a church? I don't. I saw the reports this morning. Um, the church, there are no churches in Gaza, so I'm not quite sure where the report well, is, the, is, is talking a, there's about. There's a Catholic church in there, isn't there, that is... Yeah, unfortunately, in... there are no Christians because they were dry, dro drove, driven out by... Well, there are, Christians. respectfully, there are Christians because I spoke to an MP yesterday who has family members in the church who are Christians. Well, I don't Unless know what happened. I don't wrong. know who was attacked. I didn't see the report. I didn't see the report. She said, I didn't see the report. You're, you're on the radio answering questions for your government. I mean, she's the deputy mayor, she's not a member of the government, but for your country, right? That's why you're speaking to the host at LBC. He's not just interested in how, how the bins get collected in Jerusalem, right? You are there to talk about the conflict in Gaza, to talk about the war on Gaza. And all you have to say is there aren't any churches in Gaza. Lie. There aren't any Christians in Gaza. Lie, right? We've, we've literally had the Pope intervene here. And this woman seems to think she knows better. I don't think you would have found her believable, but just in case you were questioning whether there was some truth to what she was saying, um, well, she wasn't. There are at least three Christian churches in Gaza. This is the St. Poripyrus Greek Orthodox Church in Gaza City. It's thought to be the third oldest Christian church in the world. Um, but in October, Israel admitted bombing it. I suppose that's maybe why she thinks it's not there anymore. Um, the airstrike on the church left large parts of it severely damaged. 16 people sheltering inside were reported killed, with 20 others injured. Another church is the St. Philip the Evangelist Church. Um, that's also been used as a shelter. Um, it was damaged by an explosion nearby. There's a running thread here, isn't there? Um, the deputy mayor is also wrong about there being no Christians in Gaza. Um, you'll have seen Leila Moran, the Lib Dem MP, talking about her family in Gaza. They are Palestinian Christians. And the daughter of one of Moran's cousins inside the church sent her this update. Look, Leila, I, I will put you in, uh, in the picture of what's happening. I, I, I was able to talk to mom just right now one of the numbers in her room uh, was okay and I was able to talk to her. She said we are locked in, we cannot go out and she has uh, she has nothing uh, to eat for tonight even, only can of corn. And she told me no bread, nothing. I didn't ask about the water, I forgot. But uh, but she said they we take care if we want to go to the bathroom because all snipers around, and they still at the gate of the at the gate of the uh, church the, the the tanks. But I I am I am worried about the food. This is the only thing. That's why I said I will send you a message to 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 show them how if people didn't uh, die from uh, from their uh, muscles, they will die from hunger. It's completely heartbreaking. A relative of a British MP has been sent that, and the government which is doing that to them is being funded by the British government. Right? So our government is supporting another government who is blocking people, locking people inside churches and... Uh, they're too scared to go to the toilet in case they get snipered to death because a mother and a daughter already have been. It's just, it just beggars belief. You'll have noticed in that clip, the deputy mayor also sort of tried to bring this round to her own advantage. Oh, yes, oh, there's, there, there might be churches, but there aren't Christians. And the reason there aren't Christians is because they've all been driven out by Hamas, right? So her lie, um, which is to excuse Israel's act, they can't have bothered church because there are no churches. And also, by the way, um, Hamas are really terrible. You know, that, that is the sort of media training. 
that we see forest Israeli politicians um, over the past weeks, and I'm sure they will continue to do it. Now, that claim there she made is also um, doesn't seem to be true. Um, a thousand Christians are believed to be living in Gaza and one of the oldest Christian communities in the world. It has dropped somewhat. So the number of Christians has dropped since 2007 when Hamas came into power. There were 3,000 um, or thought to be 3,000 in, in 2007. There are thought to be 1,000. I think we can't be too exact with the statistics. Um, and it is the case that a small number of Christians may have been targeted by Islamic militants in Gaza. But senior Christians in Gaza told The Guardian that relations between Christians and Hamas are ones of mutual respect. So that's a senior Christian, not a Hamas official. And a 2019 US State Department report said this, so I'm going to quote it. Christian groups reported Hamas generally tolerated the small Christian presence in Gaza and did not force Christians to abide by Islamic law. So that's the US State Department, you know, the, the Hamas-run US State Department. Israel, however, is a different story. So the impact of the occupation has been, I mean, huge on everyone living in Gaza, and that has included the Christians. So this is from the magazine Christian Today. The overwhelming answer of the question, why have Christians left Gaza, according to a new survey of local Christians by the Palestinian Centre for Policy and Survey Research, is economics. Nearly six in 10 respondents identified this as the main reason they consider emigration. Security conditions were named by 7%, another 7% cited better education, and another 7% blamed the political situation. Only 4% blamed corruption, while 3% gave a religious explanation. That's the explanation of Gazan Christians as to why some of them have left the Strip um, since 2007. I mean, it's not difficult to find a reason to leave Gaza, is it? If you are allowed to leave is one of the big issues there. Other forms of persecution. Christians in Gaza must obtain permits from Israel if they want to leave Gaza for religious reasons. Everyone has to obtain a permit for leaving Gaza for whatever reason. But if you're a Christian in Gaza, you might want to do something um, like visiting Jerusalem or Bethlehem. For Christmas or the West Bank, for example. You're not able to do that, even though it's incredibly nearby, because you're not allowed to leave Gaza unless Israel approves, and Israel barely ever approves. Gazan Christians have, though, reported the shrinking number of permits granted by Israel prevents them from practicing their faith with family living in other parts of occupied Palestine. So again, a, a similar story here. If you live in Gaza, um, then you're not going to be able to see people in other parts of Palestine because you are divided by the Israeli occupation. And I suppose actually that will be, you know, that might be especially meaningful for minority groups because obviously, you know, it's a small number of people who are um, Christians in Gaza. So if you want to have a bigger religious festival, um, then it would be handy if you could meet up with other Christians in the West Bank and in um, Israel, right? Because then you'd have a, a bigger group of people. In the West Bank and Jerusalem, Christians also come under attack from Israelis under Benjamin Netanyahu's right-wing government violence against Christians has surged in the occupied territories. So a, a full debunking there of the deputy mayor's idiotic intervention on LBC. Um, and Moira, I want to ask you about that interview. Was it ill-informed? Was she lying? I mean, uh, are they just not sending their best? I mean, I suppose she's not a spokesperson. She's, she's just the deputy mayor of Jerusalem. This is just what Israeli politicians are like. This is either their knowledge of Palestinians or their willingness to lie about Palestinians? I think it shows something deeper, which is that how big a problem the presence of Christians in both Palestine and Israel pose to hardline Zionism. Because the officials that are in charge of Israel at the moment are you know, the most far right possible. And they are really pushing for this ethno-religious state. They want to maintain exclusivity for Jewish people. You can see this in the laws that have been passed in Israel, which separates, like, separates citizenship and nationality, e.g., you know, Palestinians in Israel can be citizens, but they don't have Israeli nationality, which is reserved only for Jewish Israelis. That was codified in 2018. You know, this nation state law came in, which said only Jewish Israelis can have national rights in Israel. And it also stated that Israel is this historical homeland of exclusively Jewish people. So since the founding of Israel, what has been done is the Muslim Palestinian population has been cast in this role of as an incursive population on their own land. This idea that, you know, Muslims came in and took the land from the Jews and the Jews are taking it back. Uh, and Israel in particular positions now Gazan Muslims as these Islamic fundamentalists trapped in this enclave for the safety of the Jewish Israeli population. And if 
the Gazan Muslims are let out. They'll exterminate the Jewish population if they're given half a chance. But the Christian Palestinians really complicate this narrative. They're one of the oldest Christian communities in the world, especially when you look at you know how far back they go. Um, and they have been there since day dot. They're a real counter narrative to this claim that Israel is only a historical homeland of one singular faith, the Jewish faith, and that the Muslim population had taken this land. When in actuality, if you look at this, it was Zionist settlers in the early 1900s who turned multi-faith Palestine into you know, these separate segregated um, states and various occupied enclaves along ethnic and religious lines. And the Christian Palestinians also pose a problem because among Western allies who are quite happy to give into Islamophobia and this idea of like an incursive Muslim population who have to be so kept suppressed for the good of the Jewish population, they're much more hesitant when it comes to Christians. You've seen that with the reaction of Nick Ferrari on LBC, who's suddenly become a crusader against the mayor of Jerusalem now that he knows that Christians are involved. He's suddenly like, what's happening to Christians in Gaza? It's really terrible. Um, which is why people like Jerusalem's mayor are so clean, clean, keen to claim this idea that it's actually Muslim Palestinians who are responsible for reducing or eliminating the Palestinian Christian population. That's not true. Palestinian Christians fed during the Nakba. They were one of the first groups that were persecuted under the Nakba as well in, in Palestinian territories. Um, and they fed, fled since due to ongoing persecution. There's a journalist called Jonathan Cook who writes a lot on this. And he's written about the reason that Palestinian Christian populations, firstly, they uh, have a lower reproductive rate than the Muslim population, but also because they have more links to missionaries around the world. So it's been easier for them to get out of the region under ongoing persecution at the hands of hardline Israeli um, officials and legislation. And you showed there this article from Al Jazeera, there has been this increased persecution of Christian populations in Israel and in Palestine since that new right-wing government's come to power. You know, there's been priests saying they've been spat at, crosses are desecrated, uh, harassers say this is pagan, there's been attempts to crack down on expressions of Christianity. And you see this too also with the Muslim population, with places like of, of worship, like Alaska Mosque, becoming under great attack. And there's a reason for that. Ultimately, what we're seeing is violence against minority populations within this region by a radicalized far-right ethno-religious state. So the Christians pose this huge problem because the West are more likely to pay attention to the Christians, but they also complicate the narratives that Israel is putting out about its reasoning for why it's persecuting the, the Muslim Palestinian population in Gaza and the West Bank. One thing Israel are very good at just doing is sort of mobilizing Islamophobia in the West to sort of say we are um, the front line against the barbarians, and by the bar barbarians they mean the sort of angry Muslims, and it's uh, it, it complicates that narrative. I mean, we should reject that narrative anyway, um, but it complicates that narrative for them that they're trying to push if there are Christians involved. And I mean, when you speak to Palestinians, they would say this isn't a religious movement; this is a national movement. Right? This this isn't about Islam versus Judaism. This is a national movement of the Palestinians um, versus Israel. Um, it's not religious. Let's go back to another clip because the deputy mayor was unconvincing. I think you'll probably agree. Another Israeli politician. So this time the chair of Israel part or the Israeli Parliament's Foreign Affairs and Security Committee. So they um, were on Channel 4 trying a different tactic. You heard our member of parliament, uh, Leila Moran there, her relatives, six of them, targeted by Israeli army snipers in a church compound in Gaza. What on earth is going on? Well, that's the question to later, not to me. I, I think that uh, I can only say that we, as the Jewish people, are used to blood libels. So to hear that Israeli snipers are targeting women on purpose and not letting them leave the church uh, is something that reminds me usually the atmosphere in the Middle Ages before another holiday. Maybe are you saying it's a lie? Are you saying it didn't happen? Turkey. This is a flat lie, absolutely. No Israeli sniper ever purposely targeted any civilian to say nothing about women. Moya, what that made me think is, you know, if I was in the Israeli PR department, you know, again, this is, you know, a, a, an independent representative in the Knesset, so a head of a foreign affairs committee, so presumably doesn't take instructions um, from Netanyahu's, you know, press people. Um, but I feel like they should ration the amount they sort of accuse people of anti-Semitism. <laughs> like you're speaking to a British audience who've just heard from a British MP whose family are in a church where they're being snipered by Israeli military. 
and then you go and say it's anti-Semitism to say that. I mean, it's it, if, if if they use it this many times, I mean, there already are a lot of people who are very suspicious whenever sort of Israeli officials sort of say, oh, this is anti-Semitism. But if they, if, if they use the allegation just this wildly, you know, it's not just cynical. It seems also self-defeating. I don't know what you think of that. This representative of this Foreign Affairs Committee literally said, oh, there's not been an, any examples of Israeli snipers targeting civilians. Three Israeli hostages were killed just a few days ago by Israeli snipers. It boggles the mind. But I think you've hit upon something wider here, which is what you're saying is why is Israel's propaganda and the people that they put out to speak for Israel and defend Israel's actions, why is it so weak? And I think there's two things here. One is that Israel's actions are so indefensible that any argument being made just falls apart completely under the lightest possible questioning and pressure from a journalist. Just many journalists don't wish to do that in the first place. The second thing is these people are not burdened by the need to be coherent because they really do truly believe in this like very far right ideology. They truly believe in this message of we have to exterminate all Palestinians, we have to move all the Palestinians to the Sinai Desert, otherwise they will come for us. You know, we have to create this ethno-religious state that is exclusively for Jewish Israelis. These are the people who are currently in government. These are the people driving this war forward. And a lot of the world is like, why on earth would you know the Israeli ambassador come on TV in the UK and say openly, I don't think Gaza should exist? It's because she really believes that. She really believes that people are going to agree with her. She really is so radicalized and so far in the source that she can't understand that outside of, uh, you know, Israel, there is going to be an even more hostile reaction to what she is saying. To, it's become normalized within her circles and within the bubble that she's with it, that she's in, in government surrounded by a load of other extremists, that they'll just accept that, that they will say, oh yeah, this is normal. This is normalized um, rhetoric. And I, I think we also see it, you know, to make a comparison in the UK as well, the when far-right rhetoric is normalized with people like Rishi Sunak talking about migrants overwhelming or Suella Braverman talking about invasions. And a few years ago, that had been absolutely unthinkable. And now we just shrug. But that's what happens when you get increasing shift to the right, you get this increasing hardline rhetoric in your country. When you go into another context, it suddenly becomes this really violent thing that other people can recognize because it's not the norm there. But the Overton window has shifted so far in Israel and in public discussion that even though you obviously have like people who are uh, opposing the assault on Gaza, you do have an Israeli movement that is trying to call for this peace. But the mainstream political positions are now really far right. You see in Britain, mainstream political positions are far right. They are now, I don't even know if we can call them far right anymore because they're in the middle. Um, so it's really a case of the Overton window moving and then these people coming into a new context, delivering lines that they don't think are that outrageous and getting a severe slap in the face when it suddenly dawns on them that what they are saying to this audience will not fly in the same way it might do when they're addressing people back home. 